We turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon. We've hit Isaiah, you've gone too far. Ecclesiastes chapter 3. And I'll begin reading here in verse number 1. To everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under the heaven. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to pluck up that which is planted. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to break down and a time to build up. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones together. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to get and a time to lose. A time to keep and a time to cast away. A time to rend and a time to sow. A time to keep silence and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time of war and a time of peace. What profit hath he that worketh in that wherein he laboreth? I have seen the travail which God hath given to the sons of men to be exercised in it. He hath made everything beautiful in his time. Also he hath set the world in their heart, so that no man can find out the work that God maketh from the beginning to the end. I know that there is no good in them, but for a man to rejoice and to do good in his life, and also that every man should eat and drink and enjoy the good of all his labor. It is the gift of God. I know that whatsoever God doeth, it shall be forever. Nothing can be put to it, nor anything taken from it, and God doeth it, that men should fear before him. That which hath been is now, and that which is to be hath already been, and God requireth that which is past. And moreover, I saw under the sun the place of judgment, that wickedness was there, and the place of righteousness, that iniquity was there. I said in mine heart, God shall judge the righteous and the wicked, for there is a time for there is a time there for every purpose and for every work. I said in mine heart concerning the estate of the sons of men that God might manifest them, and that they might see that they themselves are beasts. For that which befalleth the sons of men befalleth beasts. Even one thing befalleth them, as the one dieth, so dieth the other. Yea, they have all one breath, so that a man hath no preeminence above a beast, for all is vanity. All go unto one place. All are of the dust, and all turn to dust again. Who knoweth the spirit of man that goeth upward, and the spirit of the beast that goeth downward to the earth? Wherefore I perceive that there is nothing better than that a man should rejoice in his own works, for that is his portion. Who shall bring him to see what shall be after him? Dear Lord, pray that you meet with us today, Lord. And, um, and help us to receive the message that you've delivered for us and prepared for us. And I pray that you give Brother Joshua the uh, boldness to preach your word unfiltered and uncensored. And we thank you for this blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, we're continuing in the same line, we're continuing in the same context of Ecclesiastes 1 and Ecclesiastes chapter 2. This message is called Appointed Times and Seasons. Appointed Times and Seasons. Now, in verse 1, he says, To everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under heaven. The purpose is simply this, a reason for a thing to be done or Existing, It's the purpose of it, right? It's also an intention. It's also a plan, a design, the purpose of a matter. And God says very clearly here through Solomon that everything does have a time and everything does have a season. All these purposes have their place within the realm of the time span that we know and we live in currently. I believe once we pass over into eternity, there will be no such thing as time. Time shall be no more, is what the Bible says, referring to the end of days and the alignment of things to become. But even if there was a time, a calendar, a, a way of numbering days at, at, the, at the resurrection and after we ascend into heaven, what would it matter next to eternity? 
So Solomon here again is bringing all this into our minds that we live under heaven. We live in a place where there is time and when there are seasons. And these things are constantly flowing, constantly changing. Time goes at the same speed all the time. Some of us as we get older realize that time seems to start going faster, but that's not the truth. That's not the case. Time is, is cyclical and is just intermittent in the same fashion. Do, 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 do. It's got the same cadence. It's got the same flow, the same motion. Seasons, however, they change, but they also follow the same cyclical pattern. This is how our life works. But here in the context, time and seasons... I believe it's something that we need to recognize in our lives because everything, everything here has a time and has a place and has an opportunity that we can grasp hold of. So it's good for us to recognize times. It's good for us to recognize seasons and as they come. Quite often people will say, I'm going through a season that's very sad, right? I'm going through a time span that's been very sad for me. And this is beyond what we know as fall, winter, spring, and autumn. This is simply a length of time within somebody's life that they would call a season of such and such, whether it's mourning, whether it's mirth, or what have you. Here, what I think is good for us to recognize is that these purposes have a place and have a destined or an appointed time. It's good to recognize this. The Bible talks about, and if you would, you can turn to Romans chapter 14. Romans chapter 14 in your New Testament. Uh, keep your place in Ecclesiastes, if you would. In Romans chapter 14, you will find discussed the idea of one esteeming one time greater than another, and another regarding all times as simply alike. Romans chapter 14, I believe we talked about this a few weeks back. In Romans chapter 14, it talks about, again, one esteeming one day above, one esteeming every day alike. But regardless of how you esteem days, whether I said, you know, the older person thinks they go by really fast, and the younger person thinks they go by really slow, especially when they're in school or something that's really long and boring. It seems like time slows down. But regardless, we all succumb, and we are all under the authority of the same thing, time and seasons. We all face time and and seasons and there is a place for each and every one of these appointed times and seasons no matter what perspective we take upon them in Romans chapter 14 and verse 5 it says one man esteemeth one day above another another esteemeth every day alike let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind he that regardeth the day regardeth it unto the Lord and he that regardeth not the day to the Lord he doth not regard it he that eateth eateth to the Lord and he that Giveth God, for he giveth God thanks. And he that eateth not, to the Lord he eateth not, and giveth God <coughs> thanks. When it says he's regarding the day, it says observing the day. And what's being talked about here specifically is the holidays, or the holy days, or the, or the, the, the days of notoriety within the world, within the context of the world. Back in verse 2 it says, For one believeth that he may eat all things, another who is weak, eateth herbs. So we see then that what's being talked about is one says he can eat all things, and that's a biblical tenet. A lot of the Old Testament restrictions on diets were to serve a, a purpose and a place at that time. There was an appointed time for restrictions for the diets of the people of Israel. But at this time, God said to Peter, right, he brought every type of four-footed beast, every type of creeping things down to the earth before him when he was meditating and praying upon a housetop. And he said, rise, Peter, kill, and eat. And Peter was like, not so. There's all these dietary restrictions. Unclean things have never touched my mouth. And he did it again to Peter. He said, rise, Peter, kill, and eat, showing him every type of creature that was available to do such with. And his picture, and at the point of that of that, that illustration to Peter was that the Gentiles can now be saved through Christ. God isn't just working with the people of Israel. So he used, and I believe, it, it seems strange to my mind, he used an entire nation under a dietary restriction to convince one man of, a, of a, an illustration way down the history of time, uh, right after Christ's death, that the Gentiles are now grafted in according to the mercy of God. I believe that that's how God works. Sometimes he will take a really big restriction on people in the Old Testament and use that as a picture to illustrate something to just one man. That's why people will sometimes be like, you really think, you know, I'll say, I went soul winning, it was pouring rain, and then it just stopped for like an hour and a half. And it was sunny and it was great. 
And then it was pouring it rain as soon as we got back into the van. I said, God did that for me. But come on. There's no way God did all that for you. There's no way he moved the clouds. There's no way he opened up so that the sun could shine. I believe that because my faith believes that God restricted an entire nation's dietary requests and requirements and ability and, and gave commandments in order to convince just one man to allow Gentiles within the fold. One man to go and to preach unto people that he before said, oh, they can't be saved. Oh, God wouldn't possibly work with the Gentiles. He convinced him of such through those illustrations. All that to say this, within this context, we find that there is one that believeth he may eat all things, which is what the Bible teaches. But there is another who is weak that eateth herbs. So he's the vegetarian, right? He is, he is weak in that decision. But he says, let not him that eateth despise him that eateth not. And let not him which eateth not judge him that eateth. For God hath received him. And continues, says, for who art thou that judgest another man's servant? What this is teaching is very plain and very clear. It says that one believes the right thing, one believes the wrong thing, and he is weak because of it. But this should not be a point of contention. Because him not eating meat and only eating herbs is not a sin. That's his personal decision. It says in verse 5 at the end, Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. So in the areas whereby there is room to decide your own will and apply your own will, we should not find contention one with another when there's no biblical guideline to say that one is right and one is wrong. And even in this era, we find that there is one that is right and there's one that is wrong. He that eateth all things right, bingo, you got it. Him that is not eating all things, he is weak, he is, he's, he's wrong. But it's not a point of contention because it's not sin for him to just abstain from certain types of meat. It's not sinful unto him. And it brings us all into the context of regarding the day, observing the day, observing an event on a particular day as something of, that should be elevated. Verse 5 says, one esteemeth one day above the other, the other esteemeth every day alike. And I believe that as you read down, you're going to find the context of verse 2 apply down to verse 5. This is my personal belief about this portion of scripture. But again, we need to be reminded that, that if I differ from you, these are not areas of contention. These are not areas that Christians should fight over. But here's what I believe. I believe that paralleling verse 2 with verse 5, you have one that believeth he may eat all things, who is right. And verse 5 says, one man esteemeth one day above another. I believe he's right. In the next phrase, it says, another who is weak eateth herbs. And then in the second part of that verse, it says, another seemeth every day alike. I believe that the one that says there are one day that is above another, I believe he is right, biblically. The other seemeth every day alike. He doesn't put difference between Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. He doesn't put difference between a holiday and not a holiday, a weekend and not. He just kind of treats every day alike. I believe that is not the, the biblical position. I'm going to show you why. <coughs> So where this comes to a point of contention is when it comes to our religious-esque holidays that we have. I'm talking about Christmas. I'm talking about Easter, right? Uh, sometimes people will go as far as birthdays. We have groups currently that call themselves Christians that make great stands on these. The Jehovah's Witness don't think you should esteem any day alike, right? They, they have this blank slate where every day is the same. And they actually call it sinful to lift up one day over, over another. And we know that they're wrong on many fronts. And therefore, this is why I would say, just even from a practical experience, that position is probably not a correct one, just by marking who it is. So I have a biblical example, and I believe we're lining up parallels, as Paul tries to explain in the book of Romans. I also believe that just observing people that tend to blanket all of them, at least one group, does not hold the correct position on most things. So I'm not trusting them. But I believe the Bible teaches that we are to abide in the same calling wherein we are called. So you can turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. It's to the right in your Bible. Not too many pages. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. <clears throat> See, for a very long time in the early days of my Christianity, and here's the third kind of proof to my heart in a practical example. I believed in my zeal to be separate from the world, in my zeal to just do everything biblically and push away the world that I had left behind when I believed on Christ and I was saved. In my zeal to do that, 
I became very zealous against the Easter, against Christmas, against even birthdays. Christmas I looked at as pagan and idolatrous. I took the little scriptures and I, and I used them from Jeremiah. Look, they're, they're bringing an idol in and they're making it into a Christmas tree. It says deck, just like that song, Deck the Halls, right? It's, it's wicked, it's wrong. And I, did, and I did that very realistically. Eggs, you know, I was like, look, it's pagan. It's like the fertility goddess and she's a bunny and she's doing, you know, I had all of these reasons why I didn't, I didn't appreciate or approve of that. Birthdays, my example was this, that the only people in the Bible that celebrate birthdays are Herod and uh, Caesar. <laughs> Those are the only people in the Bible that celebrate birthdays. Therefore, it's, got, it's wicked, it's ungodly, it's pagan. And I blanketed all these when I was first saved. Okay, so I was in a position where I was weak spiritually, as, as our context shows. I was newly saved. I was zealous. I had a lot of opinions. I had a lot of ideas. I had listened to a lot of messages and sermons and watched documentaries, but I never read the Bible cover to cover. I was immature. And in that immature position was when I took on that position of having great zeal against what I deemed to be inappropriate to the Christian. But again, I believe we are to abide within the same calling we are called, and we are to not judge brothers, because that's what I did. I judged a lot of people. I attacked a lot of people and said, you don't agree with me. You're obviously not biblical. You're a pagan. You're wicked. And I took that position. I took it hard. It drove, it drove big wedges in my family. It drove big wedges in, in, uh, in, in my family, my relationships, my friends. And a lot of that stuff should be the case. You should naturally, as you come closer to Christ, be drawn away. But I was, I was zealous about it and almost, almost enforced it. I was, I was so firm in these positions. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, we have this example. Look in verse 20. Let every man abide in the same calling wherein he was called. Art thou called being a servant? Care not for it. But if thou mayest be free, use it rather. For he that is called in the Lord, being a servant, is the Lord's freeman. Likewise also, he that is called being free is Christ's servant. Ye are bought with a price, be ye not the servant of men. Brethren, let every man, wherein he is called, therein abide with God. Okay, so the context here is circumcision. He is talking about those who have been saved, but now they're looking at the Old Testament, which is where I found a lot of my justification for calling most of the uh, Christian-type religious uh, holidays pagan. I looked in the Old Testament, and I pulled these scriptures out. But they looked to the Old Testament now as saved believers, and they were like, well, should we be circumcised now? Should we do these things that are kept in the law? And this is something that the Apostle Paul was constantly fighting against in the book of Galatians and Colossians and in 1 Corinthians in many cases. Though the Corinthians were primarily a very carnal church, so they didn't have too many problems trying to uh, be overzealous and doing God's will sort of thing. <clears throat> but in this case, he says, use it rather. And I look at that in verse 2. Use it rather. So are you called being um, uncircumcised? Don't become circumcised. Are you called circumcised? Don't become uncircumcised. Art thou called a servant? Don't fight to be made free. You're free in Christ. Are you called free? Don't fight to be a servant. Free. He's saying that wherein you were called, that's exactly where God wants you. That's the position where God wants you, else he wouldn't call you in that. And where I practically act this out, and what I see happening here, is that the, the where of God's will isn't as important as the, as the what of God's will. We need to do God's will where we are at and not fight and strive and try to get out of a certain situation. In regard to circumcision, it can't be changed the one way. It can't be changed the other. But either way, he's like, don't bother. Don't do it. Use it, rather. In other words, use the position that you are in to be that witness unto God. When I was first saved, I drove wedges in my family. I, drove wedges. I was not a witness to anybody. In fact, I was a very bad influence of anything. They saw Christians as, as mean, as, as vengeful, as, as hostile. And, and, and even, even among Christians, I was the same. I was vengeful. I was hostile. I, I, was, I was like a loose cannon when it came to just being zealous about keeping certain laws and about being separated in so many different ways. But as I grew, I realized that where you are called perhaps is exactly where God wants you. And we shouldn't be so zealous to get some of these things out of our lives, but allow God to sort of work those things out of our lives. We need to do it with God. Look at verse 24. Brethren, let every man wherein he is called 
there and abide with God. So we are called to a certain spot. We are abiding therein. The difference is those last two words. We're now with God. Right? A lot of the things that we are born into, the situations that we were born into, we can't change. And it's the same situation when it comes to being born again. You can't change your past. You can't change who, who your parents are. You can't change who your friends are, who your family is. A lot of that stuff, it, it's non-negotiable. That's just wherein you were called and that's where we need to abide. But the difference is, and we saw that in the previous patch as well, we need to regard it to the Lord. We need to give the Lord thanks. Wherein we are, we need to render our actions, our, our abilities, our doings unto God and abide with Him. Like it says, Brethren, let every man wherein he is called there and abide. Live where you're called. Live where you're called only with God. Being the difference. So again, I believe that it is, it is, it is right, it is good, it is fair, it is honest before God to still keep and regard holidays. Regard days that you did when, as, as you did when you were, before you were saved. So I'm talking specifically in my experience, the Christmas, the Easter, and, and, uh, and, and birthdays even, okay? Obviously there are certain things that are not redeemable. I mean, no Christian is going to find ways to redeem Halloween. There are certain ways that it's just, okay, that, that's just obvious. There's nothing redeemable. I'm not going to go to a Halloween event dressed up like Paul the Apostle and, and, and abide there only with God. I mean, that's just, that's just foolishness, right? Obviously, Christians can find nothing redeemable about something like that. But I believe that there are good merits to Christmas and to Easter and to birthdays. There are good things within the context of those events, though the world has went and messed it up, though the world has, has made it idolatrous and wicked in many different ways. And what it does is it allows you to still be engulfed in the world that you were in before you were saved, but now you're saved. So now you're with God. Now you're still remaining, abiding therein only with God. And so now, instead of me saying, Mom, I can't come to Christmas, it's pagan and wicked. Mom, don't say happy birthday to me. Grandma, I'm, I'm not accepting anything for Easter. Don't even give us a card. You know, you see how that just makes me, like, not a witness? See how I've, I've put a wall between myself where I can't even be an influence in these people's lives because I've taken certain days and I've, I've esteemed them wrong. I've, I've put them down. I've made them into terrible things. And your parents are like, well, what in the world is this Christianity? I mean, we have so many great memories of Christmas time. We have so many great memories. Like, what, it, what happened? It, it just does not make getting born again appealing at all. And, and, and not that we need to allure people with the lusts of the flesh or wantonness or anything like that to draw them into Christ. The only thing that's going to save anybody is the Word of God drawing on them. Amen. The only thing that's going to save somebody is the Holy Spirit of God drawing Amen. them through the Scriptures and hearing the preaching of the truth. But if you've said, I'm not coming to Easter, Mom, and, and, and that's the only time you see them, when are you going to give them the gospel? When are you going to allow the Holy Spirit of God to work in their life? When are they going to see the change in you? Because you've put up a wall which needs not to be put up. We see in the context of Romans chapter 14 that times and seasons, esteeming one day above another, though we may disagree with that, just like eating everything versus only eating herbs, though we may disagree on it, we can stand here and we can't, we, we, we need not leave here with a point of contention. This is what I believe the scriptures is plainly teaching. I believe the weak position, based on my experience, my understanding of the scripture, is to take the position whereby you seem every day alike and you're not going to regard any of the traditional holy days or holidays of your people, of your nationality, of your nation. And I would, I would apply this, and I don't have great understanding, but we're all from different parts of the world. And there are different events throughout the calendar year that aren't necessarily wicked in and of themselves. There's nothing necessarily wrong with celebrating them, getting together with family, though they may be lost, and enjoying that time with them. There's nothing wrong with them. But when we, when we put up those walls, we put up that separation, I believe that it's doing more harm than good. And that's my experience, and that's my understanding of what the Scriptures is telling us. So if we go back to Ecclesiastes, go back to Ecclesiastes, in chapter 3, we're going to see great big examples of things that have a time and have a season. To everything there is a season and a time for every purpose under heaven. 
A lot of these we're going to look at and be like, in our mind frame and in our context where we live, we're like, mm, maybe that doesn't seem right. But God is making it very clear that there is a time, there is a place for each and every one of these. Brother Rob read them, but I'm going to give the opportunity to just read over them again and meditate upon these things. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to pluck up that which is planted. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to break down and a time to build up. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones together. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to get and a time to lose. A time to keep and a time to cast away. A time to rend and a time to sow. A time to keep silence and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time of war and a time of peace. What profit hath he that worketh in wherein he laboreth? I have seen the travail which God hath given to the sons of man to be exercised in it. So we see many examples then of, of things that have their time and place. And verse 9 though gives you that impression that, and the answer is plain, and we've had it answered in the previous chapters, none. He asks, what profit hath he that worketh in that wherein he laboreth? There, there is no profit under the sun. And he says this, I have seen the travail which God hath given unto the sons of man to be exercised, to be worked, to be processed within. So that list of things that there's a time for, and a lot of them are confusing to us because some people actually believe there, there's no room for dancing within the Christian life. Some people believe that um, thou, shalt, thou shalt not kill covers everything. Well, thou shalt not kill means murder, but it says clearly there is a time to kill. We, we, we see also that there, there is a time of hate. Well, aren't we supposed to just love, love, love everybody? No, the Bible is clear that there is a time to hate. And when he brings it all around and he says, What prophet hath he that worketh in that wherein he laboreth? And the answer is none. He says, I have seen the travail that men are exercising in it. He's, he's, saying, he's saying life is short and vain. Life is short and vain. So a lot of these things have their time in our place, but we need not dwell upon any singular one to the end that that's all we become. We need to understand that we're kind of rolling with the punches here in this life. We're kind of just going with the flow. As life pours at us, as life comes at us, we need to be mindful that there is a time where we can be mourning and there is a time for laughter. It's just gonna go through its natural cycle, the natural course of things. Don't get bogged down, don't get trapped in the trap whereby we get sucked into a certain type. Verse 11 says, he hath made everything beautiful in his time. Also he hath set the world in their heart, so that no man can find out the work that God maketh from the beginning to the end. I know that there is no good in them, but for a man to rejoice and to do good in his life, and also that every man should eat and drink and enjoy the good of his labor, it is the gift of God. So we see there in verse 11, I have it underlined in my Bible, his time. God hath made everything beautiful in his time. Time, not my time, not my timing, not my preference. It is his time when things become beautiful. He makes them beautiful in his own time, at his own will. And we have no reference for what God's will would be or God's timing would be. Quite often times and seasons are something that God leaves as a little bit vague within the context of the scriptures. He doesn't give us defined dates. He doesn't give us defined times. If we knew exactly when all of the end times events were happening, we would not be walking by faith. We would not be seeking to please him each and every moment because we would know that we have six months left. We would know we have five months. We know we have three years left. We put things off. So we're in this faith position whereby we have no reference to know, or the Bible says here, to find out the work of God in his times but the scriptures. So we have an, a glimpse of the mind of God within the framework of the scriptures and the scriptures alone. And I believe that God wants it to be so. Look at verse 11. It says, He hath set the world in their heart, so that no man can findeth out the work that God maketh from the beginning to the end. A lot of fake, phony Bible translations have taken this verse and said, He hath set eternity in their hearts. Now, we don't get eternity set into our hearts until we believe on the Son of God and the Holy Spirit of God enters within our hearts, within our being. No, 
God set the world in each and every man's heart. Each and every man has the world set in his heart. In other words, he is drawn to that. He connects to that. Man was but dust, and to dust shall he return. That world is constantly set within our hearts. Within that framework is all we have to relate to. So sometimes I believe because our relationship is around, surrounded in this world, because our conjoinment, because our birth is from the very dust of this earth, he uses the events, the times, the seasons that go up on upon this earth to do his great and eternal purposes and works, which we have no frame to understand because he does those same things, makes them beautiful in his time with our only frame of reference being what happens in this world. So sometimes he will use our connection to the world. He will take that which he hath ordained within us, that connection with the world, the specific times, seasons, and events, and he will use them for his own glory. And here's one example. Here's one example of how he took a day and, and elevated it and used it for his eternal purpose. Lazarus. Okay, their tradition, and we have a similar tradition, is that somebody, when they die, isn't buried immediately. It's not like they're dead and we just drop them in. There is a time of mourning. There is a time of visitation. There is a time of preparation before they are set within the grave. Jesus used the space of that time after Lazarus had died, after Lazarus had been prepared after Lazarus had been buried and after four days he knew that the funeral as far as it goes because people travel from far and from wide would be at its peak everybody would have descended upon the funeral event we do the same thing right it's not that the funeral is the same day it's, it, it's several days after usually and so he used the situation that he knew, the time, the purpose, the event that was esteemed above the other, the time that was esteemed, the day that was esteemed above another to come to the people that were mourning and say, Lazarus, come forth. And because he did that, he had the greatest reaction, got the greatest glory when Lazarus rose and walked out of that tomb with his grave, grave clothes still upon him. And God got the glory in that situation using a specific time and a specific season and an elevated day for his own glory. It was the appointed time when he would say, Lazarus, come forth. And it was at that time when he would get the most impact with the men that were going through it. So here's another one. And I didn't prepare this too much. I, did, I honestly did not think about doing this type of sermon until early, early this morning. But the one frame of reference that we have, the one elevated day that we have, that we need not shy from or, or push away from or, or negate, is the one that we're living today. And that is what? Does anyone know? It's known as Palm Sunday. Okay? Palm Sunday is simply an event that is recorded in scriptures. We've given it a type today. The world has taken it and twisted it and made it to their own thing. It's very heavily Catholic. It's very heavily, you know, there's religiousness to it that we don't necessarily agree with. But the event Palm Sunday reveals some great things within the scriptures, and it highlights my point that it is good to esteem some days above others. It is, it is right and godly to do so. Specific relation, Palm Sunday is, of specific relation to what is known as the day of the taking. Exodus chapter 12, Exodus chapter 12. And here I'll highlight the point. If you can get there, Genesis, Exodus chapter 12, second book of the Bible. We know this to be referring to the Passover. So in Exodus chapter 12, and in verse 3, we read this. Speak ye unto the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of the month, they shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for an house. And if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next unto his house take it according to the number of the souls. Every man according to his eating shall make your count for the lamb. For your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. Ye shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats, Ye shall keep it until the fourteenth day of the same month, and the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. So the context 
of the scriptures right before Jesus was taken to the cross at what is known as Palm Sunday within the scriptures, not given that exact name, but the, 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 the great arrival of Christ, the triumphant entry is what it was called, lines up scripturally with this tenth day. This tenth day was the day that out of the lambs, out of the flock, they took just one, spotless, without blemish, right? They chose the lamb, and they set it aside. And verse 6 says, and ye shall keep it up until the 14th day of the same month, and then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. So what we have here on the first day of the week, the 10th day of the month, is that they took the lamb out, and until, from the 10th, unto the 14th, they kept it aside until they killed it. Okay? So how does this picture, what's going on? The apostles would have understood this. The apostles would have acted upon this. And this was such a great event, even within the context of Jewish Israel at that time, so that they all partook of it. And I believe God took this event and took this holiday and used it for his own glory. And he did, when he did so, he fulfilled many like scriptures. And he came unto them and did great things. So on the tenth day, it's a Sunday. Four days pass, they kill the lamb. For those four days, they have kept it, preserved it. And in the life of Christ for those four days, you will find him uh, not going in Jewry. Because his, his actions in raising Lazarus, and soon after when, when he rode in triumphantly unto Israel, it's the story when he came in, he cast out the money changers. He went into the religious institution and threw out all those that bought and sold in the temple. And so he spent... From the day that he was received as a king in the triumphant entry until four days later, being kept, being preserved, away from Jewry, away from those that would threaten his life, away. He was kept in store. He was pulled out from the flock, if you will. He was separated from the flock and kept for his appointed purpose. The appointed purpose was fulfilled four days later. That would be the calendar Thursday. That Thursday night, and we have a Thursday night, Friday morning, Friday night, Saturday morning, Saturday night, Sunday Right? We have three days and three nights from the time that Christ was killed on the 14th day of the month until he rose on that first day in our calendar year, which was the Sunday. And so in fulfillment of the scriptures, we have that that Sunday, which was an event very highly esteemed among the Jews in which they separated for the Passover their specific lamb, to the day that they would kill it, and then three days and three nights later, when Christ rose again. What we have played out here is a transition. They started off with a very Jewish holiday, and the apostles took part in this. And when they, when they did that, they acted out exactly what had happened, right? Because Christ had the Passover with his brethren, right? And then later on that night, he was the Passover into a whole nation. Mm -hmm. And when he was slain and he was sacrificed, he directly fulfilled the prophecies that were all contained within that Old Testament parable, that, not parable, that Old Testament type, as it played out within the truth of Christ. And then he rose again three days and three nights later. So what we see is a transition. That Sunday, which was the 10th day, to the Thursday, which was the 14th day, to the Sunday when he was arose again, we went from Jewish to New Testament Christianity. That transition had taken place. And when that whole nation engaged in those times, in those seasons, in that event, they were all able to experience together as a nation that transition, whereby the Jews were put behind, and the new was set forward. But the Old Testament was set aside and the new became to fruition. That transition took place. And if, if the disciples were to have dropped their Jewishness, like I did when I was just saved, right? I was just like, man, this is all pagan, this is all wrong, this is all wicked. I'm not doing any of these traditional events within my family. If the Jews had done that, if those apostles had done that, they would have missed the picture, they would have missed the type, they would have missed Christ fulfilling the Passover as he had promised he would. They would have just missed it. They would have missed out because they refused to take care of and take part in something that was Christian-ish, that was Jewish, that was whatever. I don't believe the apostles took part in anything that would have contrasted the religion of Christ. They didn't do anything that was sacrilege. They didn't do anything wrong. And in the same way, in our lives, we don't have to do anything in the traditions of, let's say, Christmas that would offend God, that would be a front to God. Here's just one example at the top of my head. If your family has a tradition whereby you all have a toast at dinner and you're drinking alcoholic wine, 
Christians should say, no, I'm not taking part of that. I love being with my family. I love spending time with you. I love exchanging gifts. I love that, 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 and all things. But I draw the line at things within the context of this event that would cause me to sin against God. Now, I'm not Jewish, right? I have not lived in this culture. And though the traditions that the apostles did were not evil in and of themselves, the thing that I'm reminded of is that if you mind these same traditions only unto the Lord, that's where he will find you at these appointed times. And that's what we experience here. He will make his triumphal entry into even your events, those, those holidays that you experience. Christ came to the Jewish event to show Christianity. In the same way Christ can come to the pagan, mixed up Christmas, let's say, and show Christ through me. And I believe that thoroughly. In Ecclesiastes 3 and verse 14, if I go back there, Ecclesiastes 3 and verse 14, it says, I know that whatsoever God doeth, it shall be forever. Nothing can be put to it, nor anything taken from it. And God doeth it, that man should fear before him. His purposes for coming in his time and making everything beautiful is to the end that all men should fear him. God will meet us where he where we are at in order to perform that will. He will make that triumphal entry into our lives. The times and seasons, though they change and they're cyclical in their nature, God, I believe, meets us and arranges for us and orchestrates opportunities whereby he can fulfill his purposes in us even through these. With due reception of a king, we need to open up our hearts and our homes to him. And this is how we have done it. In the beginning, Christmas was bad. Then we have a time where I kind of grew in the Lord. And I started to realize that a lot of the things about Christmas are redeemable. What is it? Well, we take a day that may not be related to Christ's birth, but we, we lift it up as a day that we will celebrate Christ's birth. Uh, we, we take giving gifts one to another and make it not a commercial thing, but a special thing from the heart. We take a lot of things whereby instead of having rum and eggnog at night, we're having Bible stories and we're reading the stories about Jesus Christ. We're taking what is good about the parable um, as the world would call it, but the truths of the scripture, we're applying them to that specific time and place. And we're using them, rather, as opportunities to reach others. And we're not just negating these things. So how did this work out in the life of the apostles? Well, let's look at Matthew chapter 21. We're going to walk through quickly the appointed times and seasons of what is known as Palm Sunday. Matthew chapter 21. <clears throat> so like I said, the apostles were... Jewish saved men, but they were culturally and by nation and by nativity and what they were born in, they, they, were, they were Jews by all, by all stands, aside from maybe a few of them that it's, it's debatable of their nationality. But they took part in what was nationally a holiday and Christ came to it. Christ showed up. Christ transitioned them at that time over to Christianity. Matthew chapter 21 and verse 1. For one's sake, I'm just going to read through it. And when they drew nigh unto Jerusalem, and were come to Bethphage, unto Mount of Olives, then sent Jesus to disciples, saying unto them, Go to go into the village over against you, and straightway you shall find an ass tied and a colt with her. Loose them, and bring them unto me. And if any man say aught unto you, ye shall say, The Lord hath need of them. And straightway he will send them. All this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell ye the daughter of Sion, Behold, thy king cometh unto thee, meek, and sitting upon an ass, and a colt, the foal of an ass. And the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them. And he brought the ass and the colt, and put on them their clothes, and they set him thereon. And a very great multitude spread their garments in the way. Others cut down branches from the trees and strawed them in the way. And the multitudes that went before and that followed cried, saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he was come into Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? And the multitude said, This is Jesus, 
the prophet of Nazareth of Galilee. And so here the event is portraying exactly what the scriptures had said it would be in fulfillment of. This is them, and they had made some sort of cultural significance through not just selecting a lamb, but selecting a man that would ride in in the triumphal state. They would lay down palms as an homage that they would often do for kings. Lay down their clothes as an homage that they would often do for kings. And they did so year after year, year after year, year after year, as a way of acting out that they would one day receive their great king coming in the exact way that it was prophesied. And this became a ritual within the Jewish community. They did it year after year, year after year, the same day, the same time, all the time. This was a high day. This was a day that was esteemed above the other. And when this happens, they directly fulfilled Zechariah 9, chapter 9, where in verse 5 it says, Tell ye the daughter of Zion, this was spoken by the prophet, Behold, thy king hath cometh, thy king cometh unto thee, meek and sitting upon an ass, and a colt the foal of an ass. And in direct uh, application, he fulfilled another scripture there. He fulfilled another prophecy there, where it says in Isaiah chapter 9 that he would be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of of peace by putting himself upon the colt upon the full of an ass upon a horse upon a, a, a beast that was not war ready he was signifying that his triumphal entry would be at a time of peace or be leading into a time of peace yeah. he was offering himself there as stated year after year after year with any other man that the prince of peace would come humbly unto them throned upon a full of an ass just humble, just meek, bringing in peace with him. And that acted out the same thing that they'd done time after time after time after time again with just any man. The only difference is here, the multitude says, who is this? Maybe they had gotten used to the same guy sitting upon him. Maybe they got gotten used to the same group of men sitting upon him. Maybe it was a Pharisee, a certain scribe. Who knows? But they said, who is this? The multitude said, this is Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth of Galilee. This is Jesus. So while they had done this time after time after time, and this was a routine, this was a holiday, this was no different than any other year in their minds from the time of Exodus, this one was different because this time it was Christ. This time it was in fulfillment of the scriptures. This time Jesus had come to their holiday. Jesus had shown up. I'm certain that they had mixed it up. I'm certain they, they were doing things differently. I'm certain it had become paganized, right? It was Judaized. It was a very Jewish holiday. So just by nature, there were probably a lot of traditions of the Jews welled up within this holiday. But even still, Jesus showed up. And he partook by being what was intended that he would be, by being the fulfillment of that. And his disciples were there. Verse 6, and the disciples went and did Jesus, as did Jesus, as, or and did as Jesus had commanded. They went, and it was Jesus that commanded them to do such. So another thing that was fulfilled was that he was marked as the king. He was taken from among the lambs, and he was selected as that king. Just as it was in 2 Kings chapter 9, and verse 12, when Jehu was appointed king, they laid down the palms, they laid down the clothes, signifying that the king had come, right? This was just a ritual to them. And maybe the ritual of it all kind of downplayed the significance of the event that was taking place. And maybe a lot of them didn't get it. Maybe it was just any other thing. But there were some there that got it or would get it in the near future. So this plays out in four other Gospels. Turn, if you would, to Mark chapter 11. Mark chapter 11. And as you're turning to Mark chapter 11, let me read for you Psalm 118. Go ahead to Mark chapter 11. Psalm 118, verse 20. This gate of the Lord into which the righteous shall enter. I will praise thee, for thou hast heard me, and art become my salvation. The stone which the builders refused is become the head of the headstone of the corner. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day which the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. 
Save now, I beseech thee, O Lord. O Lord, I beseech thee, send now prosperity. Blessed be he that cometh in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you out of the house of the Lord. God is the Lord, which hath showed us light. Bind the sacrifice with cords, even unto the horns of the altar. Thou art my God, and I will praise thee. Thou art my God, I will extol thee, exalt thee. O give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. Some symbolism of note. Verse 20, the gate. Christ entered in through the gate of Jerusalem. The righteous entered in. The stone which the builders rejected has become the head of the corner. We're going to learn more about that. The stone which the builders refused has become the headstone of the corner. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in his eyes. Isn't everything beautiful in his eyes and in his timing? This is the day which the Lord hath made. This is the appointed time which the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it, and they pray unto him now. Lord, send prosperity. And here's the direct quote which they said, as Christ entered in, which may have become a vain tradition unto them. Blessed be he that cometh in the name of the Lord. And thus signifying, thus pointing back to this psalm where they say, God is the Lord. And how many times, especially in Luke, was Jesus himself called the Lord? And the Lord said, and the Lord said, and the Lord said, God is the Lord here upon earth. This is the day that he hath made. Rejoice and be glad in it. And blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Thou art my God. Thou art my God. The psalm cries out. And I believe this pictures and this leads to fulfillment of what we have already seen within the context of the triumphal entry. In Mark chapter 11, just going to look at one verse there. Mark chapter 11 and verse 11, it says, And Jesus entered into Jerusalem and into the temple, and when he had looked round about upon all things, and now the eventide was come, and he went out unto Bethany with the twelve. So we see here Jesus enters in as was prophesied. He was selected. He was called the king. They said, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. God is the Lord. Bring your peace with us. Bring your peace with you. They cried out, affirming the scriptures that he had fulfilled as he walked in, though some of them maybe had no clue. And he looks upon everything that he sees and immediately goes out to that place of refuge, to that space, to that gap, whereby he would be preserved unto the next four days. Luke chapter 19, Luke chapter 19, another account. And this is an interesting one because uh, not all the Gospels contain every single event. But this is one that is actually contained within all four. So you can get lots of insight, especially when you do the Gospels. You need to get extra fingers. Sometimes I wish I had more fingers so that I could bookmark all of the Gospels as I'm going back and forth with them. But it's good practice to read the Bible this way and to get and glean and see what each perspective offers differently of these things. In Luke chapter 19 and verse 36, in Luke chapter 19 and verse 36, the Bible says, And as he went, they spread their clothes in the way, remember, signifying his kingship. And when he was come nigh, even now at the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed be the King that cometh in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven, glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees from among the multitude said unto him, Master, rebuke thy disciples. And he answered and said unto them, I tell you that if these should hold their peace, the stones would immediately cry out, signifying that the stone, the chief cornerstone, which the builders, which the religious, the Pharisees, the scribes, the hypocrites, had refused, had rejected, had been appointed the head of the corner. As the people in unity, as the great multitude in unity, cries out, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Well, who is this man? It's Jesus, they cry out. It's Amen. Jesus. And therefore, though the Pharisees rebuked him and refused him, the multitude pictures as lively stones. The disciples pictured as not lively stones would cry out, even if these were to hold their peace. Those parallels come together again as the people are typified by the stones that would cry out because these are stones upon the chief cornerstone, which is Christ, and they're builded upon him in that fashion. So we see again a fulfillment of that same passage, of that same parable, of that same scripture. I keep saying that. 
Zechariah 9, verse 9. The Prince of Peace being confirmed in Isaiah chapter 9. 2 Kings 9 and the manner of anointing a king and re receiving him into the nation. And Psalm 118 where it talks about the gate that he entered. It talks about the stones. It says, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. It says, God is the Lord. The Lord is God. It is him whom we look for. It is him who will bring us peace. And the builders rejected these same stones. And Christ as the chief cornerstone, though he was rejected by the builders, the religious, those that founded, those that built up their own idea of what the religion should be, Christ came into their religion and the stones welcomed him. He looked about in Mark chapter 11 and he saw all this. And here we see what actually happens and transpires is that the mighty throng receives him and the religious refuse him. But we see then the power of that religion to take hold. And this is, can be a little bit of the danger of, yes, partaking of certain events and enjoying family events. Is that There is the danger. As these people were fickle, and one day they were crying, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. A few, days, a few moments later, really, they were saying, Crucify him! Crucify him! They were very fickle people in their religious zeal. They got trapped into the Pharisees' lives. And the builders that rejected him would eventually bring stones along with them. And this is the danger, again. It's not completely without danger. We are as, as sheep among wolves at all times. We are to be wise as servant and harmless as dove. So when we put ourselves into these uh, holidays that we have within our family context and we put ourselves within those events as the disciples put themselves and as all of these great multitudes put themselves within the context of their Jewish nationality and their Jewish religion we too and myself when I put myself within the context of Christmas let's say may be susceptible to being swayed maybe be susceptible to being deceived to being tricked to being trapped within that same mentality that I had before. And so there is the danger, and that is a very real and present danger. But regardless, Christ came. We see Christ coming to the context of that event that we see. And therefore, while we are watchful and while we are careful, when we do the same thing, I believe, too, we can go and have Christ show up to those events, to those days that we esteem above the other. It is God... And though the people didn't understand, it is God, and though the disciples were even confused at this time, it is God who maketh everything beautiful in his time. And he does it that men would fear. John chapter 12 is the last place we'll go. John chapter 12. And in John chapter 12, in verse 12, we see another example Another perspective of the same events. But the chief priests, sorry, John 12, 12. On the next day, much people that were come to the feast. So they, they came to the feast. They came to the holy day. They came to the high day. When they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they heard specifically that Jesus was coming to this event. They were, he was coming to their Jewish feast. They took branches of palm trees and went forth to meet him and cried, Hosanna, blessed is the king of Israel that cometh in the name of the Lord. Being very specific, he is the king of Israel, and he cometh in the name of the Lord. And Jesus, when he had found a young ass, sat thereon, as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, thy king cometh, sitting on an ass's colt. These things understood not his disciples at the first. But when Jesus was glorified, then remembered they that these things were written of him and that they had done these things unto him. He recognized that his disciples were missing something. They had a missing understanding that would not come to its fruition until the end once Jesus was glorified. And nevertheless, he commanded them, as I believe he commands us, to wear in the same calling that you were called, there abide only with God. There abide within those same things, in the same context. Because if they would have pushed away from this, if they would have pushed away from their Jewish traditions, if they would have pushed away from their family's traditions, from what their fathers had taught them, from what they were raised in, they would have not understood now, and they would have not understood ever, because they would have been missing the illustrations. They would have been missing the acting out of the scriptures that are contained. They would have been missing the fulfillment of 
prophecies that we find here. So Jesus here, he comes at the appointed time. He visits at the appointed time, even within the context of the uh, tradition that he's held. He comes to them, and he is welcomed as a king in verse 13, when they say, Hosanna, blessed is the king of Israel, and receives them as such. The only problem was, the only thing that was falling short was the understanding of the people in fulfilling this. And so this is why I say it is not wrong, it is not evil, it is not wicked, it is not harmful. I think the Bible actually gives leave for people to enjoy the same holidays that they enjoyed as a young one, whether they're Christian or whether they're from whatever nationality. If they can be redeemed, if the events, if the activities of what's going on is redeemable, is being able to be brought into the context whereby Christians can live wise as servants and harmless as doves within that context, I believe it's right to do so. Because I see practicality in many ways in my experience. I see practically lived out in many ways in viewing others. I see it within the scriptures in the context of showing things that Christians ought not to debate about and saying that one is weak and one is strong. And I also see within the lives of the disciples as they went to a Jewish feast, as they went to a Jewish event and Jesus entered in to reform, to change things, to do away with many of those things. I see, yes, the context and the given um, opportunity for Christ to come where we're at and to bless those through us in those same situations. I don't think it's always right for us to just separate. Obviously, we're not going to be able to redeem something like May long weekend. We're not going to be able to redeem something like Halloween. We're not going to be able to redeem. There's so many places where we draw the line as Christians, but I believe it to be a poor testimony when we just separate from things that are good and wholesome and can be redeemed. And, and to, to rather push away from those things and then not allow for the triumphal entry of Christ. Yes, even into my Christmas when I'm with lost families. Yes, even into my Easter when I'm amongst lost families at a feast. Yes, even within to the context of a birthday, the celebration of a birth. And the many other things that are traditions of your family whereby if you were to just cut it off, you would just offend people. You would not be showing that mercy and that love and that compassion of Christ to come and to meet people where they are at. And that's why I believe it's good to open some of those doors and to leave some of those doors open, drawing the lines where we in conscience have to draw lines. When we do that, we are giving opportunity for Christ to make his triumphal entry within to our lives, within to the lives of others, and we're allowing him to fulfill his word through, yes, even a Jewish event. Yes, even a Christian event. Yes, even a Palestinian event. Yes, even whatever event that is traditionally part of your family, you are allowing for, you are giving provision to Christ to enter into that and have his triumphal entry into your life. I'm glad that Jesus met me where I'm at. I'm glad he didn't make me reform myself and change everything before he met with me. And I should be the same way when I go to my family. I shouldn't expect my family to do away with Christmas in order to make it fit into what I perceive as the biblical context of Christmas, right? I meet them where they're at, just like Christ will meet them where they're at, within the same lines that we have to draw for consciousness. So we don't get swept away like the disciples did. And one day we're saying, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. The next day we're saying, crucify him, or become double-minded. And we need to be wise as servants, harmless as doves. But I believe it is possible for Christians to do so within the context of the cultures that we live in. Our culture, there are many traditions that are redeemable. There are many things that can be enjoyed from the position of being a Christian and you still will not be looked at as worldly, though we all have differing opinions on these things. And some people may and some people may not agree with you. This is an error we gotta remember. It's not a point of contention. If somebody wants to celebrate Christmas with their family, don't rip on them. There's no grounds for that. If somebody wants to celebrate Easter with their family, don't rip on them. There's no grounds for that. These are areas whereby everyone needs to be fully persuaded in their own minds. Now, if you're going to a Christmas event and you're doing the toast and you're drinking alcohol, I'm going to rip on you. I'm going to say you're wrong. That's, that's wicked, right? If, if you're going to the Easter event and you're just like, I don't know, you've, you've got like Ashtaroth up there and like, you know, you're bowing down to idols and 
uh, right, you, you got to understand that all of these things, there's a time, there's a place for them. There's good and there's rough. We need to, within the context of living in the culture we live in in Canada, and living in the cultures whereby our families were grown and we were raised in, being that witness unto God within the same context that we were called in. Are you called being circumcised? Don't become uncircumcised. Are you called being served? Don't become a servant. Are you called as a servant? Don't seek to become a master, and vice versa. You need to be and live and abide in the same context wherein you're called, only with God. That's the only thing that's different. And let God do the separating. Let God do the work to get your family away from you that's doing all the things. Let God do all of those things that he gradually will do. Because if you go and you try to do those things yourself, you will not allow the opportunity for the triumphal entry of him into your life, into your family's events, into your family's hearts. But close those doors. Don't do those forcefully. People will close doors for you. You don't have to make enemies. Believe in this book. will make all the enemies you need. Make sense?